Let's All go. right. So listen, we'll, open, do, we'll talk about open AI. All right. Open AI is a, uh, a company that um, builds uh, artificial intelligence software and platforms. <laughs> they have one platform called GPT. It is on its third version. As part of GPT-3, they created chat GPT, which is a chat interface where you can ask questions to AI. The results are nothing short of stunning when they hit. Uh, some of them are a little bit mixed, but uh, Freeberg has spent the last 48 hours uh, drinking white Russians with oatly milk and playing with chat GPT, including his question to the chat GPT, which was write a script of Chamath, Sachs, and J. Cal uh, talking about the future of AI in the style of a Quentin Tarantino movie. And I have to say, it was pretty great, the result. Go ahead, uh, Freeberg. Tell us what you discovered. Wait, I think you guys should read this real quick. We can cut it out if it's stupid, but okay. You want Chimoff, us to actually read, read the script? Yeah, read, I don't read think you got the Quentin Tarantino part right. I mean, I, I think know. it was like impressive, but it, there's no f bombs. There's no like Tarantino s dialogue. Well, and, and by I the way, they, they excluded all of that from right OpenAI. All. They took they took out all cursing and violent cussing and violence yeah. from OpenAI. That explains it because if this and was a Tarantino script, there would be some choice language totally. in here. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's like the PG Tarantino script because okay, with no cussing, no violence, no you sex. There's no pop culture references. Yeah, you do the narrative. Go ahead. The scene opens on Chamath Palihapitiya, David Sachs and Jason Calacana sitting at a dimly lit table in a smoky bar. A bottle of whiskey sits in the center of the table, half empty. Chamath leaning forward, his eyes intense. So, what do you guys think about this chat GPT thing? David Sachs takes a sip of his drink. It's impressive, no doubt about it. A large language model trained by OpenAI that can generate human-like text in a variety of styles and formats is a game changer. <laughs> Jason nods. <laughs> Definitely. It's one of the most advanced AI systems we've seen to date. It's going to have a huge impact on the way we use and interact with AI. Chamath frowns. That's what I'm worried about. With a technology like this, the possibilities are endless, but so are the potential dangers. Sachs leans back in his chair. Oh, come on, Chamath. You're not still stuck on that whole AI is going to kill us all thing, are you? Chamath leans forward again, his voice low and serious. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying that Chad GPT <laughs> is going to turn into Skynet overnight, but we need to be careful about the way we develop Clooney? and deploy AI. We need to make sure that we're using it for good and not just for our own gain. <laughs> J. Cal nods. I agree. We need to make sure that we're responsible <laughs> in the way we use AI. And that includes making sure it's accessible and affordable to everyone, not just a select few. Chamath with a dirty smirk. <laughs> and let's not forget about the importance of regulation. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that we have the right laws <laughs> in place. Okay, okay, this is, to this prevent is the this use of AI. <laughs> 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 I'm calling, the director's calling cut. <laughs> cut, that's cut. it, scene. You know I mean, scene. We're, we're not going to finish it's it. It's not that far off. I mean, it's 60% well, of the way there. I actually, there, there, All uh, there's you have to do is put one. in a Biden for Sachs. If you blame Biden, it would have been perfect. Let me tell you guys something stunning about this, stunning. Um, this platform. So this is GPT 3.5, which is an interim model to the, what people are saying is the long awaited GPT 4.0 model, um, which I think they announced in 2020 uh, and has been in development for some time. So the model, this GPT 3.5 model was trained in three steps. They do a great job explaining it on the OpenAI blog site where they collect some, some data and then there's a supervised model, meaning that there are humans that are involved in tagging and, and then the model kind of, you know, learns from, from that system. Then you ask the model questions, you get output and then humans rank the output. And so the model learns through that ranking system. And then there's kind of this third optimization thing, and then it's fine tuned. So the, the model itself um, has several steps of kind of human involvement and, you know, kind of it sources its own data and, and, and builds it. You know, what's incredible about this model, the total size of the software uh, package that runs the model is about 100 gigabytes. Isn't that amazing? Like, you could fit this model on probably what 20% oh, of the storage space on your iPhone. And you could run this thing and you could probably just talk to it for the rest of your life. Um, and it, it's really kind of an incredible milestone. But I think what was so stunning to me about this, I, I know you guys are probably expecting something to be said like this, but you could see so many human knowledge worker roles and, and, and functions being replaced by this extraordinary interface. So kids can do homework, that's easy. 
uh, software engineers can get their code optimized and can get their code written for them. There's great examples of how software code has been written uh, by this interface. You could see real estate insurance salespeople being replaced by some sort of software like interface like this. Copywriters, you know, make me a hundred mm -hmm. versions of a commercial or an ad Customer that I can support? then use. Customer support completely replaced, right? If you guys remember, there were these automated customer support companies that started, uh, you know, two decades ago. Never and there was worked. this great flurry. Mm -hmm. All BPO businesses were all about lower cost human labor. Yeah. Now the cost of human labor goes to zero. My prediction, which is, so everyone's got the obvious prediction, which is there's going to be a hundred thousand startups that are going to emerge. I mean, this is kind of like this moment where the internet came along and everyone's like, this changes everything. I do think everyone thinks and feels that. So the obvious next step is a bubble will form. <laughs> so <laughs> Can I ask I, a I technical question though, Freeberg? Um, and yeah. then uh, Chumap, you're probably yeah, thinking the my, same my, thing Let here. me just finish my market prediction and okay. then we'll do the, but I think because everyone's so hyped about this and, and we all know this, It'll be all overfunded. the VC attention, yeah. all the investor attention is shifting to this capability. Mm -hmm. And how do you apply this sort of capability yeah. across all of these different industries and all these different applications? And as a result, my guess is the next hype cycle, the next bubble cycle in Silicon Valley will yes. absolutely be this generative AI business. Um, okay, but uh, is it, this is a little technical, but how would it know the difference between like Y O U R and U R when it is processing natural language? If you were to do like your anus or your anus, how would that Freeberg? How would it know the difference between your anus and your space anus? It'll it'll learn that you know. <laughs> it's a joke. Like, it didn't yeah, land. Yeah. It was a joke yeah. about your anus. Yeah. It didn't land. Try again. Yeah, I think Let's I try honestly again. the AI try the AI again. probably would have made a better joke than that. It would have made a better joke for sure. So somebody so, so did so it in our group chat and said, Can "Do I, intros um, like J Cal," and they were terrible. So at least I have a job for another year. I've AI to pretend you're the all in pod besties telling Uranus jokes. <laughs> that would be what pretty would hilarious. Sorry, let me just say one more thing about this open AI thing. I, I do think that the biggest and most interesting. Um, thing to think about is how this will um, disrupt the search box. The, the search, you know, the way search works at Google, you know, and, and the internet search is there are these kind of servers, these web crawlers that go out and gather data. Some are structured yes. data feeds, and some of them are just crawlers. And then that data is indexed or in the, in the structured way, it's kind of made available for, for serving directly on the search page. And so much of that is is indexing. So I search for a bunch of keywords, those keywords, and, and perhaps with some natural language context are matched to a result page, and I click on that, and, it, and it's linked out. Years ago, Google started a product called the One Box, where they could take structured data, like what is the weather in San Francisco today? Yeah. And that, that top of the search result page just presented that data because it knows with high certainty the question you're asking, and it knows with high certainty the answer it can give you. Yeah, clipped it from somebody's one, website, right? So if that starts to become everything, Mm. then that one box interface, and it's not just Google's ability to access all this data and index it and serve it and store it, there could be a lot of competitors to the one box and a lot of competitors ultimately to search. Mm. Um, and ultimately, you know, Google's core product, their, their, their search engine could be radically disrupted mm. by an alternative set system or set of systems that have more of a natural language chat interface. Which um, and I, literally, I which is literally why uh, Google bought DeepMind, and there were a collection of human-powered search engines, Mahalo included, ChaCha, Answers.com, who were trying to do the human-based version of this. It totally. just didn't now, scale. I, we we don't want to yeah. get ahead of ourselves because one of the things we don't know is how much is going on in DeepMind. They're 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 not very open like OpenAI is. They they talk about some of the advanced frontier stuff like um, AlphaFold and so on, and they've been public about that. But a lot of that is really to generate interest and hype and what's next. But my understanding is DeepMind's been applied to everything from ads, ad, ad optimization, but also the ranking on YouTube videos to get people more engagement on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these ways that DeepMind's been applied within Google services that we don't and see certain, and certainly within search. Yeah. But the question is, is there an entirely new interface for search yes. that risks Google's core search business? And I think that there certainly will be a lot of money thrown at this. And if anyone has any interesting ideas, Send me an email. Sachs and then Shamath. Yep. Yeah, I, th we'll I think that's a really way. interesting point. I saw a thread on this where somebody was asking GPT, you know, a bunch of questions. Like they were like generally like coding questions and they were actually comparing the result in Google versus GPT. And Google would just give you a reference to like a link to some page 
Whereas GPT-3 would actually construct the answer, like a multi-paragraph answer that was far more detailed and in a way user-friendly. Yeah. And whereas like the Google page would kick you over to a reference where it was like this one, two, three sort of maybe someone had created a checklist, but it just wasn't that detailed. It really is uh, pretty interesting. I thought um, Andreessen tweeted a really interesting example as well, where he asked GPT to create a scene from a play starring a New York Times journalist and a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur. They were arguing about free speech and each passing asserts the view associated with his profession and social circle. We don't need to read the whole thing, but I thought this was like spot on where I was actually like both sides are making their best arguments. And it's like to each other in a conversation that seems intelligible, like they're making yeah. their points at the right time in the conversation. It's like they're playing off each other. In other words, it actually reads like a conversation. I actually thought this one was more impressive than the one with the bestie impersonation because I, agree. I actually thought that the one about all in didn't really capture our personalities per se, but this one actually does a pretty good job capturing the arguments in this debate. So Jamath, pretty impressive. Any thoughts here? Yeah, lots. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time learning about this area. Six years ago, a team that I partnered with who was at Google that built TPU, we've been building silicon for this space. So we've been kind of going from the ground up for the last six years. A couple things that I'll say. The first is that I think we're going to replace SaaS with what I call mass, which is models as a service. And so, you know, a lot of what software will be, particularly in the enterprise, will get replaced with a single use model that allows you to solve a function. So these chat examples are one, and you can name a bunch of SaaS companies that were purveyors of SaaS that'll get replaced by essentially GPT-3 or some other language model. And then there'll be a whole bunch of other things like that. If it's a, you know, expense management company, they'll have a model that'll allow them to actually do expense management or blah, 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 forecasting better. So I think SaaS will get replaced over time with these models incrementally. That's phase one. But the problem with all of these models, in my opinion, is that they're still largely brittle. They are good at one thing. They are a single mode way of interfacing with data. The next big leap, and I think it will come from one of the big tech companies or from OpenAI, is, and we talked about this, I talked about this a few episodes ago, a multimodal model, which then allows you to actually bring together and join video voice data in a unique way to answer real substantive problems. So if I had to steel man the opposite side reaction, so I think there's a lot of people gushing over the novelty of GPT-3. If I had to, or chat GPT, if I had to, if I had to steel man the opposite, what I would say is it's going to get somewhere between 95 to 99% of all of these very simple questions right, because they're kind of cute and simple. There, there is no consequence of saying write a play because there is no wrong answer, right? You either kind of, it, 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 it tickles your fancy or it doesn't, it kind of entertains you or it doesn't. When this stuff becomes very valuable is that when you really need a precise answer and you can guarantee that to be overwhelmingly right, that's the last one to 2% that is exceptionally hard. And I don't think that we're at a place yet where these models can do that. But when we get there, all of these models as a service will be very much commoditized. And I think the real value is finding non-obvious sources of data that feed it. So it's all about training. So meaning you can break down machine learning and AI into two simple things. There's training, which is what you do asynchronously. And then there's inference, which is what you're doing in real time. So when you're typing something into chat API or chat GPT, that's an inference that's running and then you're generating an output. But the real key is where do you find proprietary sources of data that you can learn on top of? That's the real arms race. So one example would be, let's say you build a model to detect tumors, right? There's a lot of people doing that. Well, the company that will win may be the company that actually then vertically integrates, buys a hospital system and get access to patient data that is completely proprietary to them and covers the most number of women of all age groups and of all ethnic, you know, ethnic categories. 
Those are the kinds of moves in business that we will see in the next five to 10 years that I find much more exciting and trying to figure out how to play in that space. But I do think that ChatGPT is a wonderful example to point us in that direction. But I'm sort of more of that yeah. case, which is it's a cute toy, but we haven't yet cracked the one to 2% of use cases that makes it super useful. You know but I think the first of? step, but just sorry, just, but the first step will be the transformation of SaaS to mass. And mm. then from there, we think we can try to figure this out. It reminds me of in a way when you when you give that description of like, hey, this is really interesting, uh, but it's not complete is remember when GPS came out and like people were like doing turn by turn navigation, they drive off the road because they were trusting it too much. And then you know, over 20 years of GPS, we're kind of like, yeah, it's pretty bulletproof, but keep your eyes on the road. Same thing that's happening. Uh, and, and these changes you, you, tend you to be right, slow. These last, these last 100 or 200 basis points literally takes decades. Exactly. So the last 15% of self driving is like the decade long, you know, slog. That may take and a century, 15% may take a century, but the last 2% will take a few. It's decades. like the change happens very slowly. And then all at once for people who don't know what a, a TPU is, that's a tensor processing unit. This is Google's um, application specific circuits, right? And custom silicon that they invented for TensorFlow at the time. Yeah. So if you want to try to although now the modality of AI, we've changed that as well. So now we're totally in the world of transformers. So we're not even using you know, you're not letting the tensors flow the way they used to.